seated. All right, well, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 17, if we could tonight. Matthew, chapter number 17. There was a minister who tells of a visit to a parish church years ago in the state of California. And finding a stirring red and orange banner on the wall of the church, it's, that banner said this, Come Holy Spirit, Hallelujah! Exclamation point. It was declared in words printed under a picture of a fire burning. The bishop was also interested in the sign directly underneath the banner, which said this, fire extinguisher. (laughs) Think about it for a moment. (laughs) So much for the church's commitment to spiritual renewal, right? Whether we realize it or not today, we hold the very keys to the greatest need that exists right now, and that is spiritual revival. We know the need, but why does it tarry is really the question we need to be asking ourselves. Why is God not sending His Holy Spirit down in great power like He has done in the past? And there are many, many instances that we could read about in history, and even what somewhat modern times, that God has done some special things. But why not here? Is the times of refreshing no longer available? Are there no showers of blessing left for us? As we prepare for our annual revival meeting, I think it would be prudent of us to ask ourselves some hard questions and at the same time to ponder the great possibilities that exist for us even today in the 21st century in regards to spiritual revival. Here in Matthew chapter 17, we have a story It's not necessarily about revival, but there's some elements within it that we can pull out that that will help us see some parallel truths as we contemplate the subject matter we'll see tonight. Matthew 17, verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not hear him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. As I mentioned tonight, I'd like to examine this story and see some parallel truths that we can equate to this thought tonight of why revival tarries. Why revival tarries. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening, this opportunity to be here tonight. I do pray that this would stir our hearts, challenge us, and inspire us in the same regards. That there is a need for revival, Lord God, and it is desperate in our day more than ever before, probably. And Father, I pray that you would just really work in our lives tonight, that the Spirit of God would have free reign here, that the devil would be bound any distractions would be silenced, and Lord, that you would be glorified, most importantly. Meet us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when people speak about the subject of revival, you know, it's often in a historical context. They, we talk about events that we read about in the scriptures, of course, and in history. And, and for some reason, we get this idea kind of inadvertently that those were strictly for times of the past. They were for those times in which they, they took place, and today we cannot expect revival as they saw back in those times. Whether or not it's spoken, many of God's people have adopted that prevailing attitude. Unfortunately, sometimes the study of prophecy even lends itself to that fatalistic mentality that is really detrimental to the cause of Christ. People sometimes believe that the last days will be hopeless days of apostasy. And no real viable spiritual movements will occur. There are many verses that probably are are used 
in this regard. I think of this one in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, as Paul is describing the times of the arrival of the Antichrist. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And they talk about that falling away first. And, and of course, apostasy is a falling away from revealed truth. And it's believed at times that we are witnessing uh, a great apostasy today. And certainly there is apostasy uh, in our nation today. Our, our nation knows better in many regards. Our nation has had the truth and freedom to have the truth longer probably than any nation that has ever existed outside of probably the nation of Israel. And there, is, there has been. But you know what? There is an apostasy everywhere. You know tonight that there are countries that there is great movements of God going on and there's actually an expansion of the gospel. You don't hear about it as much, but there's places like China today that they are alarmed. The Communist Party there is alarmed at the growth of Christianity in, within their borders. And they believe within 10 years that they are going to have a real problem handling the situation, if you can put it that way. You go to the country of Iran today, and there's a, the fastest growing religion there, if I can call it that, is Christianity as people are coming to Christ, even under some of the most adverse conditions on the planet. And there's places and pockets where, where things are happening. And maybe uh, the West, as we would put it, is not seeing what it had once seen. Don't think that if the West falls, that there isn't other places that it cannot spring up. That everything hinges on whether America is alive or not. We don't know what the future holds. But I do know this. Yes, we have apostasy, but guess what? They had apostasy in the first century, too. They really did. If you read the books of 1 John, Jude, many of Paul's epistles, Peter's letter, letters as well, you see the warning, the constant warning of false prophets and people teaching truths that were incorrect, were apostatizing, if you will, from revealed truth. Paul writes about it in Galatians, how they were being deceived. Peter writes about, uh, about uh, them in his epistle, about uh, people who are using the alluring of the flesh to draw away disciples after them. First John is actually written in response to uh, the Nicolaitans and, and other apostate groups that were denying the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, there's lots of examples of the first century. They were having an apostate faith as well. <laughs> so to say that it's just something that is going on in our time really is not exactly accurate, if you will. We just see it because we are here in the now and now. But it has happened in the past. And it's happened in other places. Really, the problem is that sometimes the way people define the last days is actually faulty. Many who believe the Bible agree we are living in the last days. The question is, when did these last days begin and when do they actually end according to what the scriptures say? You read different things and, and you hear different preaching and, and things like that, but, there's, but we have to go back to the scriptures to discover, okay, when did these last days start and when do they, be, they end? Because that's critical in understanding about, more about the subject that we're talking about. Many who believe the Bible agree we do live in the last days. The question is, again, when do they begin? And when do they end? According to the Bible, the last days began around the time of Christ. Hebrews 1-2. The writer of Hebrews says this, speaks of Christ, hath in these last days. He is speaking, when he's writing this, he is speaking in the present. You know, this is about 2,000 years ago now. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. It was marked, really, by the events of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. If you remember Acts chapter 2, Paul, or excuse me, Peter, preaching that day, he quotes an Old Testament prophecy out of the book of Joel. Acts 2.17 is Peter speaking, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And Peter was saying, this is a fulfillment right now of this prophecy in Acts chapter 2. 
And what was the days then? It was labeled as the last days. The last days. It appears that they will end when Christ comes to reign. Because it mentions in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. I believe that portion of Scripture is talking about the millennial kingdom. Okay? So there's going to be... The last days seems to accompany this time. Some would say maybe it, it, it ends at the rapture. That's debatable. Whatever the case might be, we, we could all agree, though, that we are living in the last days, though, right now. We're, we're here right now. If that be the case, think about what we just looked at and consider this, that we are still living in the same time period Peter mentioned. You get that? We are still living in the same time period Peter mentioned. It shall come to pass in the last days that, the, that there would be a pouring out of the Spirit of God. We are living in the days in which God's Spirit can still pour out. Despite the prevailing sin and spiritual apathy that exists. In fact, if I can just put this, inject this in here, that's about the best time God works. Because God looks for impossible circumstances to work through just to show that he rules over that all. Our text here tonight is about a father who's seeking help for a son whom was under some very severe demonic oppression. And as we look at this story, we, are, we can see some paralleling truths that exist that help us understand why revival is tearing in this day and what can be done to see it occur. First off, let's consider what I call the obstacle. The obstacle. Now in our story, we see a man again who has a son that since his childhood had been plagued by an evil spirit that was attempting to constantly destroy him. Look at verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. Now what we have here is this, this situation of what we would call demonic oppression. Mark chapter 9 opens up more details about exactly what was going on and how long this had existed. But the point is, we've got an obstacle here. The devil is in control of the circumstance. And nobody's able to do anything about it. You know, it's very similar to what we see today. The devil is raging at work. If you can't see the devil at work in this society, uh, you, really, you really lack a lot of discernment. I mean, it's not even being hidden anymore, some of the demonic activity that is going on right now. Some of the gross things that are, being, that are happening are so blatantly in violation of the scriptures, it's not even funny anymore. And before, there was somewhat of a hiding of this. I remember, you know, even politicians back in my day were very careful about saying certain things and avoiding certain things around even, even the things of the, of the Bible or Scripture and Christianity as a whole. But not anymore. It's open season on that kind of stuff. And while they proclaim liberty, they're actually uh, themselves in bondage with their ideologies. But the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well today. And there's only one thing that the devil has in mind with that spirit. I think Jesus put it well when he said in John 10, the thief coming not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's, what, that's the whole objective of the devil. And if he can get mankind to help him out through the spirit of disobedience working through their lives, he'll do it. But Jesus said, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's God's goal. But we have a devil out there that's trying to do everything he can to divide and conquer, destroy and defeat, and, and he'll make it look as if people are doing good when they're actually doing much evil. Remember, the devil comes off across as an angel of light, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 
And what he shrouds around is makes people think that they're doing right when they're actually doing wrong according to the scriptures. So how can he get away with that? It's because people are ignorant of what the scriptures actually have to say. Because churches are not doing their job of teaching people what the scriptures say. And it's a sad day and age that we live in. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5a, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's his goal. The devil spirit, the antichrist spirit, floats around the world deceiving and enslaving people to sin. And ideologies that enslave multitudes of people to sin. By all outside appearances, it seems like this spirit of Antichrist is more active with every passing day and seems to gain more ground every single day, doesn't it? And it's discouraging at times when you look at the news and you look at all the garbage that is being pumped out and, and, and all the blame shifting and all these different things that are just wicked and wrong. It appears this man in our text had tried every conceivable means to help his son he even brought him to the disciples, but nothing availed, did it? Not a thing availed. And sometimes when it comes to seeing God do something miraculous, something revival is, we are stumped too because we have tried every conceivable thing to bring it about, yet nothing has availed at this point. And sometimes our past experiences with God have shrouded our view of what God is actually capable of doing to the point where we don't believe that he can anymore. We read God's word and we see the great promises, yet because we have not experienced the fulfillment of such promises, we consider that they do not work. We conclude that they don't work, they aren't literal, or were not for this time period, or they weren't for me. We cannot allow our experiences to pull down the validity of the word of God, though. Our experiences are to be lifted up to the Word of God, not pulled down, not the Word of God pulled down to our experience. Well, I haven't experienced it, so it must mean it cannot happen. No, why do we always put the question mark on God instead of ourselves? Why is it that we always put the question mark on what God says and not ourselves? The question needs to be asked, what am I not understanding or what's not right within my heart that I have not had the experience that God has said that I could have when it comes to answer to prayer, when it comes to personal revival, or even greater than that. We have to get out of this, we have to get out of this mentality of accusing God of being untrue to His Word. That's the mentality we find ourselves in because, well, I haven't experienced it yet. Well, the thing about it is, maybe we haven't pursued it rightly. Maybe we haven't, maybe it's, there's something within us Oh, no, that could never be the problem, right? It could never, we couldn't be the problem, could we? You know how perfect we are? And Yeah, right. I think this, this verse holds true. Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, let, but every man a liar, right? Let me tell you something. We, we've got to get out of this mentality of, well, I guess it just doesn't work. It's not that it doesn't work. It's the problem is we're broken. The greatest obstacle sometimes is our, just our own lack of faith in what God says. We say we believe the Bible, yes, but what it comes down to, it's, in many cases we don't as much as we say we, we do. As was in the case of the te in our text, because when they brought this man to Jesus and the disciples were stumped, what happened here? Jesus, Jesus was kind of blunt with his statement, wasn't he? Look at verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. He doesn't say, Oh, you poor, poor people. <laughs> this is kind of this is a rebuke. O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? In other words, how long shall I put up with you guys? <laughs> it's like, wow. I mean, he's pretty pretty staunch here. Bring him hither to me. What we have here is there was a major problem of unbelief. In fact, Jesus even tells them that later, because of your unbelief. See, we simply don't believe that God can do what he did in the past. We have a heart of unbelief. 
What does the Bible say about a heart of unbelief? What does he call it? Hebrews 3.12 Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Wow. An evil heart of unbelief. That's what God calls a heart that doesn't believe him on anything. Doesn't give him the opportunity Could it be tonight that one of the sins that we must repent of is our own unbelief? Our lack of believing God. Whether you're talking about revival or any other area of life that God may be speaking to your heart about right now and mine. Is there an area where your heart is like, I don't believe God can do that. That's an area that needs to be repented of. In fact, that may be the greatest obstacle of them all. See, the obstacles aren't necessarily all the sin and all the strongholds of Satan out there. The obstacle is right inside here. But we're too busy looking at and blaming and blame shifting out there. I'm as guilty as the next person. Because I look at this world sometimes and I get so mad and frustrated with it at times when I look at it I'm just like what are these bozos going to do next but you know what if it weren't but by the grace of God saving me 20 some years ago I'd be doing the same bozo things and sometimes I still even do but it's, it's in here it's in here my own sin of unbelief is one of my great, one of the greatest obstacles that I have And that's what, was, that's what was causing the problem here. And they hit a wall. Unbelief will cause you to hit a spiritual wall in life. May God help us to come to the end of ourselves and repent of that. As we see, third, or secondly, the omnipotence. Well, of course, they bring this child to Jesus and, and uh, we see in verse 18 what takes place. And Jesus rebuked the devil. And he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. This verse intrigues me a lot when I consider it and consider other passages in the life of Christ. And you'll understand what I mean here in a moment. But it's really intriguing. You know, we, we have here this man's son who for years, since his childhood, if you cross-reference with Mark 9, found no relief of this problem. Zero. None. Oftentimes he's having to go rescue his son from the devil that threw him into the fire, into the water. The, in fact, there was in Mark 9, if I remember correctly, when he came to Jesus, he was on the ground wallowing with foam coming out of his mouth. I mean, this, this was a situation that was humanly very difficult to deal with. And everybody involved with it suffered constantly. But the minute God stepped into the whole thing, it it changed, didn't it? In fact, it uses the the phrase here in verse 18 that the child was cured from that very hour. That very hour. You know, throughout the Gospels, there are other miraculous workings of Christ that happened right away as well. That very hour, if you will. We're in Matthew. Go back to Matthew chapter number 9. I'll just show you a couple examples here. Matthew chapter number 9. There was an example here. Verse 22. About the lady who had the issue of blood for 12 years. She had been to many, many different doctors. Was no better. Was actually getting worse. She touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Verse 22, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now let's go to Matthew 15, verse number 28. Matthew 15, and verse number 28. We have here, again, another instance where... a uh, a woman, the Syrophoenician woman, I believe it is, had a daughter who was vexed with another devil. 
And she came to Jesus, pleading and begging. It would not be denied. In verse 28, Then the, Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that, notice, very hour. In the book of John, chapter number 4, verse 52 and 53, Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. This was a, this was a man who, who came to Jesus, who walked a good day plus to get to him, and returned back with the word from, from Jesus that his son would be healed. And that's the context of what's being said here. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. Sometimes the Bible uses the term immediately. If you go to Matthew chapter number 8 again, go over there, Matthew chapter number 8, and verse number 31, uh, it says here, Matthew num chapter number 8. Oh, I don't have the right verse. Bummer. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. I can't find that one right at the moment. Forgive me. Matthew chapter number 20, verse 34. The Bible says, So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. These are two blind men. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. And there's a few other instances where it's used. I, we don't have time to look at them all. But the point is, when Jesus did these miracles, in many, if not all cases, the hope of getting better for any of these peoples didn't exist at all. In fact, many of them had tried multiple different things, but it was, it was impossible for them to find healing or help. Humanly speaking, their fate was sealed without a manifestation of divine power, and that's what, they, that's what they sought to receive and did. My point being is this. Sometimes we look at the prevailing conditions around us and conclude that revival is not possible. People are too hard. Sin abounds too much. Apathy is at an all-time high. It's the last days, and we cannot expect a manifestation of God's power, etc., etc., etc. However, to believe that is really to limit God himself. It's to put an, an expiration date on his promises, really, when you think about it. That they expired decades back, and they no longer are meant for us, even though we still live in the same time period as Peter mentioned. It puts an expiration date on his promises. It, it's to nullify his ability. And it disregards his sovereignty in human affairs. To be honest, what it is is an excuse to cover up our own laziness and apathy to seek him, is what it amounts to. When we don't believe in what he can do. Say, oh, God can't do that anymore. Could it be we just simply don't believe him enough to seek him for it? We don't have time to quote unquote seek him? Sometimes it's a narcotic to desensitize us to our own guiltiness. Hey, the Bible tells us that great things are still possible through God Almighty himself. In fact, Jesus gave a great promise in John 14, verses 12 through 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You know, over the centuries, there have been people who have dared to ask God and dared to believe for, for greater things than Jesus ever did. And they saw it. And they saw it. For some reason in our day and age, we've gotten too, too sophisticated, too educated, too inoculated to believe the reality of, ver of a set of verses like this. These things are still possible. And the reason they're still possible is because the one on the throne is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? He's still the same. See, 
the point I'm trying to get at even more so is that the problem isn't with God's power. Look at these words, immediate, same hour, you know, <laughs> against these things that were humanly impossible. It's never been a question of God's power. It's never been a question of God's strength and ability or that things have just gotten too far out of control for God to do anything about. It's never been a question about that. The problem, again, goes back to God's people, us. Again, simply, we, we simply don't see God for who He is and what He's truly capable of performing. And I'm as guilty as the next. We, have, we, have, we, we just don't see Him like past generations saw Him. We don't lean on him like past generations do. We've gotten so much used to the idea that if I can't manufacture it, if I can't pay for it, if I can't do it, and if I can't, you know, we can't organize enough and we can't get enough uh, investors into something, it just cannot be done. But God wants to show us that, you know what, he transcends all impossible circumstances by human standards. He transcends all that. And he's the same God today as he was in yesteryear when, when great things moved throughout this country and countries of the world. He's the same God that, 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 uh, w that, was, that broke down strongholds in, in places people didn't think were possible. He was, he's the same God. And, and the thing is, we've got to come back to that realization. I think we've been fed so much of the world's goop uh, from, the, from the media that we think that we can't that God's dead, or God's weak, and, and, and the and the prince of this world tries to tries to sh tell us, you know what? Uh, I've got I've got the people, I've got the powerful, prominent people who, who who are more than happy to throw their money at my causes. That if you look at the scriptures, they are so blatantly antichrist, you can't even begin to understand it. And sometimes we get so intimidated by that, but we forget that we have the God on our side that owns it all. He owns it all. And can overthrow anything in a moment, as we see in those verses. And we've got to get back to seeing who He is. Allowing God to reveal more of Himself so that we can begin again to believe that, you know what? It happened in those days in the past. Why can't it happen now? And that's the greatest obstacle that we may have to get over. It's just to actually believe that something could actually happen now. My desire tonight is to call us back to the omnipotent creator God who desires to glorify his name in the earth through our lives. Part of that is through genuine outpourings of His Spirit and revival. The book of Acts is a historical account of how God used ordinary people and allowed them to see extraordinary things happen that changed the world. And guess what? We're ordinary people too that God can use the same way. The thing is, we've got to get back to seeing Him for who He is as God that he is the strong one. It doesn't matter how powerful any devil is in this world. God can break that thing down in a moment's notice. Because he's the omnipotent one. Do we see God for who he is again tonight? Do we see him as the big, the big creator God that he is, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, do we see him tonight in that capacity? Or is our God so small that we are technically bigger than him in our own minds? May we throw out those bad views of God and may we accept what he truly can do and what he's capable of doing through every single person who will pursue him. Well, thirdly and finally, let's talk about the oversight now, after the devil was departed, the disciples desired to know what had prevented them <laughs> from casting out this devil. Right back in our text, Matthew 17, you know, the devil's gone, the child's cured, yay, good things happen, but the, devils are, or the disciples are sitting there like, what didn't we get? 
Verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus' part and said, Why could we not cast them out? Now they had had success before, but this time it was different. And unfortunately in their minds, they evidently, based on the, of the passage and the way it's written, it seems that they had concluded that this kid was an extraordinary circumstance that couldn't be handled. And that was kind of a, an affront to God himself. <laughs> And Jesus let them know their oversight. In other words, things they missed as they served, as this served as a good object lesson for them to learn some truths. Verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. What was some of their oversights? Of course, we've, we've referred to this already, but number one, it's worth mentioning again, it was their lack of faith. Evidently, their faith had been smaller than a mustard seed in this case, <laughs> when you think about it. They had concluded that this situation was outside the normal ability of God to do anything about. They saw obstacles instead of an opportunity for God to work. And too often we are, seeking, we are seeing too many obstacles instead of opportunities for God. Jesus illustrates to these gentlemen that mountains can be moved if they just had a little bit of faith to exercise. Evidently they didn't have that here at this point. And it prevented them from being able to see God remove this devil out of their lives, out of the life of this child. Number two, there was a need for prayer with fasting. Verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. This is very illuminating to us because it explains to us that there are devils, there are situations that cannot be overcome by just prayer alone that there must be the incorporation of this thing called fasting. And there isn't enough being said about fasting in our day. And I can't, that's part of the problem. How often do we fast and pray? Have we, well, maybe the better question is, have we ever done that? In your Christian life, have you ever done that? I'm not saying you skip breakfast one morning. Or multiple. I always fast every morning. I never have breakfast. Well, that's, if you naturally do that, that's not fasting. <laughs> fasting, there's, this isn't a, I, I don't have time to get into details and pointers and all that kind of stuff. I've done that in other messages. But fasting has a way of humbling our flesh that we need to have happen. Which enables us to be more sensitive to God and a cleaner vessel for the Holy Spirit to work through. If you ever fasted for even part of a day, you'll begin to notice it's how it affects your body, how it affects your, your system, and how it humbles you. If you can go a day, you'll notice the, the, how the flesh is weakened. If you can go multiple days, <laughs> it gets even more so. What happens is when the flesh is weakened, the spirit can be strengthened. We are in a humbler state of humbler state before God. And remember, the Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. One thing I, that, that God has taught me more and more is the great significance and the great need of humility in the life if you're ever going to see anything from God. If humility is not within our hearts, and, it, and it's not hard to get prideful. It's amazing how, hard it, how easy it is to get prideful and hard-hearted. But if humility does not exist in life, there is just not going to be a work of God going on. And God has to sometimes remove some things and, and gives us things in our lives. But you know, one way we can try to humble ourselves is through fasting. That's a voluntary thing you and I can do. And evidently it's a very important thing if we're going to see some things happen that are on a grander scale. You'll find that your prayers will take on a whole new dimension 
when combined with fasting. It will take on a whole new dimension that you've, ne- that you've never, never maybe sensed before. They, 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 it brings in a new power. It, there's something about it that's really powerful. And you can see that in the scriptures. We may get into this passage, but you should read Joel chapter 2 once. In fact, you, 1 and 2 really, but Joel chapter 2 talks about revival. When everything is, when your back is against the wall. I might preach on that before in this series, I'm not sure, but the point is, one of the things that gets brought up in that passage is fasting. It's fasting. Because evidently strongholds exist that need fasting attached to our prayers for the victory to be won. But the problem is we won't fast because we don't want victory enough in our life. We don't want victory enough. I think it's next week the Olympics are taking place, if I remember right, over in Tokyo. It's supposed to be last year. They got rescheduled. And the Olympics are, are kind of a, I kind of like watching some of the, the, the events. It's, it's fascinating to watch some of these people who, who compete in the Olympics. In many cases, these people have given up literally their lives to train for the chance to go for the gold wherever it's being held. And there's some that they they achieve it. And there's some that they say should achieve it, but because of one mistake, something happens. And they don't find themselves on the podium. A fluke in their performance. A sudden injury. Something beyond what they, they thought would have happened. But, they, but my point is they give so much. I mean, many of these people have given up their childhoods, really, in a lot of cases, to be on that stage. And, of course, for every one of those people you see that get to that stage, there are many, many that didn't even make it. And you say, why did they, how did they make it? Well, they're hungry. They're hungry for that, that gold medal. How is it that people can be hungry for something that is so temporal? I mean, think about how many people here today remember the gold medalists from the last Olympics. Maybe you could think of a couple of names because they were household names. They've gotten to be pretty big, but I'll guarantee you most of the sports, you don't have a clue, do you? Maybe none of them at all. You get my point? We can get so hungry for something so temporarily, for something that is so temporal, that will one day never, uh, one day be turned to dust. We get hungry for that, but we are too full to have God. We're too full to have Him. Why? Because we've got our belly full of the temporal things. We're too full to have God. We're too full of the world. We're too full of self. We're too full of pleasure. We're too full of entertaining ourselves. We're just too full to the point that why should I... I'm, I am full in need of nothing, but Jesus said of the church of Laodicea, you don't realize you're poor, wretched, blind, and naked. Revival tarries till people are willing to pay the price to get it. That's the point. Revival tarries because people are willing, until people are willing to pay the price. And people in the past were willing to pay and we need to as well. Because our nation will either have a revival or it will have ruin. If you can't see this thing teetering, you really don't understand much about what's going on. Number three, it's never a matter of God's powerlessness. 
as we've kind of established that fact already, but I want to bring out something that if they had that information, they would have been more successful. This is my point. Instead of concluding God and his word is broken, maybe we just need to ask him to understand what the key to victory is. Remember, the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally, and faith not. What we should be asking again is, God, what am I missing here? Or what, what information do I need, am I missing that is pertinent to the victory that I'm seeking here? And of course, the victory we're talking about tonight is revival. And maybe there's some things that we don't understand that God needs to teach us. Maybe there's some things that we are not seeing, we're blinded to, that God needs to reveal to us. See, God had to reveal this truth about the fasting part to them that they didn't know about. But what they had gone and done was concluded that this, this situation is too possible for God to do anything about. And that's their, that was their wrong mentality there. Their mentality was completely faulty. They had concluded that God is, too, is not powerful enough to deal with this devil. That's far from true. What they didn't need, realize was what they needed to do in order to see God's power unleashed. And sometimes that's part of the problem. Some of our own ignorance or blindness that needs to be revealed. And we need to be asking God those things. That was an oversight on their part, again. Again, instead of concluding God is broken, maybe we just need to seek him to understand what the key to victory is. You know, start in the place that God is able and allow him to, in our minds, and allow him to uncover the deficiencies of our understanding or our faith instead. Start with the truth that God is able. If he's able and what his word says is true, okay, what don't I understand? What am I not, maybe not doing? Or what am I blind to? Or what sin is there? You know, those are the questions. We need to ask questions of ourself. Again, instead of asking or putting God on trial. And too often that's what we do. When it comes to revival, there may be some things God has to teach us before it comes. May have to illuminate our understanding too may have to even remove out of our lives. Because the problem isn't with God. The problem comes back to us, just like it was with those disciples. May we be willing students so revival no longer has to tarry. And that we can see God do some things that he wants to do, even here in the 21st century. Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If God has spoke to your heart, I want to encourage you to speak to him. Maybe you'd like to come down to the altar and pray. Maybe you'd like to do it there at your chair. But the pianist is going to play. And maybe we can pray this. May God, may God revival start in my heart. May revival start in my heart. May God, may you do it in my life. God, may revival start in my family. May revival start in our church. May I get the victory that I need. Too often, we again, we put God on trial. But yet the question needs to be, what is it in me, Lord? What is it in me? You know, what that shows is God's supremacy and our humility when we do that. Too often pride gets in the way. And we justify ourselves. Say, God's wrong and I'm not. We have to remember... Who's the one who's always right? (laughs) It's not us. It's not us. 
Why does revival tarry? Because within our hearts, there needs to be some things put set right, just like these disciples. These disciples need to get some things right. Their understanding illuminated. They didn't believe and they didn't know. And may we tonight really get a hold of this truth. It's our desire to see revival here. That God would touch this place in a special way. We live in a broken metro area. People are confused up the wazoo about what is right and what is wrong. And it plays out with the things that have happened here and continue to do so. And even across our nation today. But these are opportunities, not obstacles for God. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Do we believe that enough to where we will seek God even to pay the price? It may take some time, but that time is God is using to make us and prepare us to receive the blessing. May we, as we prepare for our upcoming revival meetings, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive Him. May we open our eyes to, or allow God to open our eyes to things that would cause revival to continue to tarry. The time is short now. May we be burdened and passionate. May we seek God with all of our heart. May we give Him the benefit of the doubt, and when we struggle with that belief, be open with Him. And We could go to Mark 9, talking about this same story and the man said I believe Lord but help thou my unbelief I can feel the reality of that may we tonight respond to God accordingly wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee may God speak and us respond Father in heaven, tonight we want to thank you for the word of God. I do pray that it had spoke to hearts here in a very special way. I pray that you would help us, Lord God, to see you for who you are and that you would do a great work in each and every life here, that you would bring personal revival uh, to every person, including myself, Lord God. We want to see your spirit work, but Lord, there's faultiness within us all. And Lord, I, I just pray you'd help us, Lord God, to overcome all that. And that your spirit could pour out, not just in this church, but Lord, of churches of like faith that are trying to do very, very best to stand by the stuff. But Lord, there there needs to be a touch of God again. And I pray that our revival meeting will, will be part of all, part of you doing that. Thank you, Lord, for this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, just a few quick things. Uh, again, reminders about... Um, uh, the prayer revival cards. I encourage you to take some with you, if at all possible, and distribute as you go. Of course, we will have outreach on Saturday at 10:30. If you can come out for that, as well, we'll be sowing them all throughout, kind of mostly here in the city of Bloomington. So, if you can join us for that, that would be great. Um, let's see here. I do have a, a quick request. If there's anybody that would have some time, and you know how to do a good job with. Uh, hedge trimming, and then we also have, you see the burning bush that's outside there in the front there, uh, kind of died on us, and we need to get that removed uh, in the front. And if, if that is something that you would be willing and able to do, would you just look me up and we can chat? So I'd appreciate that very much. But uh, look forward to this Sunday. Be praying that God will allow you to invite somebody, and they'll come to church with you. Let's, let's pray for God to do some real s- sweet things, even before.